Uh, good afternoon, everyone. If you're on the East Coast, as I am, or good morning, um, if you're on the West Coast, like Shelly, or somewhere in between, we are so thrilled that you've decided to join us for today's webinar. We're celebrating today the launch last week of this brand new book, The Courage Way, which was co-authored with Shelly Francis and the Center for Courage and Renewal with a very special foreword from our special guest, Parker Palmer. Welcome, Parker and Shelly. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And before we get started, I wanna let all of you who are on today's call know about a few technical considerations. We will be having a, an interview uh, conversation with Shelly and Parker. And then toward the end of the session, we're gonna open up for questions from you. So you can feel free at any point to use the question panel and type your questions in, and we'll get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, Let's see what else. We are recording today's event and we will be sending some follow-up later. And once you receive that follow-up, you'll be able to share the recording with any friends or colleagues who may not have had a chance to attend. Um, and I'll go ahead and mention, we're also going to, going to have another conversation this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern time so that we can pick up on our international audience. And it's gonna be a different conversation from this one. We have a completely different set of prepared questions. So in case you love this event and wanna come back, uh, we would love to have you and you can still sign up for that. So if you want to take a quick moment and uh, tell me about yourself in the question panel, maybe where you're calling in from. I know that Shelly is in Seattle at the offices of the Center for Courage and Renewal, and Parker is in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm in Lambertville, Michigan, as always. Um, looks like we have North Carolina, Chicago, Georgia, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri. So I'll let you know about those. Uh, Toronto, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Wyoming. Oh, they're coming so fast now. Um, almost every state in the union. Uh, some folks in Vancouver. Costa Rica. Uh, we have someone calling in from Scotland. Um, wow. So thank you to all of you who are taking the time. New Zealand caller. I'm not sure what time it is in New Zealand, but um, wow. Um, so thank you so much to all of you who are joining us. And uh, Again, I wanna invite you throughout today's broadcast to go ahead and put your questions for Parker and Shelly into the question panel, and we'll loop around those uh, toward the end of the call. Now we wanna find out about who was on this call, um, and we're especially curious to find out what your previous exposure to the work of the Center of uh, Courage and Renewal has been. So I'm gonna launch a poll for you, and we would love for you to tell us about yourself. So um, please check all that apply. This is my first exposure to Courage and Renewal. I'm a facilitator for Courage and Renewal. I've attended a program through Courage and Renewal. I'm a Parker Palmer fan. Um, and if there are any other nuances that you'd like to share, you could go ahead and put those in the question panel. Uh, thanks to all of you who are voting and we're gonna share those results in just a moment. I think uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting mix of folks today. Um, it looks like about 55% of you have never uh, been exposed to the work of the Center for Courage and Renewal before. Uh, and the other half looks like, you know, Parker's family, just like he thought it might be. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll. And uh, here's what we have. We have, um, let me show those results. Hmm, how can I do that? Just give me a quick minute while I fight with the technology. Let's share those results. So 55% of you said that this is your first exposure to Courage and Renewal. Only 6% of you are facilitators. 24% have attended a program through Courage and Renewal and 46% of you are Parker Palmer fans. And I'm one of the newest uh, among you today. <laughs> so, uh, let me take a, a quick moment. Some of you don't need uh, the introduction to these two amazing people, but I, for those of you um, who are meeting them for the first time, Shelly Francis is the Marketing and Communications Director at the Center for Courage and Renewal. She's also the author of The Courage Way, along with the center. And one of the things that um, is most unique about Shelly is that her career has all been about bringing light to the best kept secrets while bringing people together. So. Uh, to be able to make a difference in the world. And I have personally just loved being able to walk with Shelly through this book launch process and uh, dive into the learning of the book. And I see her live out the learning in the book um, in the way that she lives and works. Um, so thank you, Shelly. And Parker Palmer, uh, many of you 
obviously are super fans of his. He is the founder and senior partner emeritus of the Center for Courage and Renewal. And he has written nine books. And Parker, I understand you have a new one coming this June called On the Brink. Did I get the title right? On the On Brink the, of Everything. Everything, right. On the Brink of Everything, Grace, Gravity, and Getting Old. So those of you who are fans uh, might want to check out that book. Um, and also Parker's Forward to the Courage Way. So thank you both for being here. I'm so excited to dive into this conversation. And we're going to start with a really big question. Uh, so what are the five types of courage that we see in our lives? All right. Well, as I was writing this book, I was really curious about the kinds of courage that we talk about in courage and renewal programs and what are the kinds of courage that most people just think of as the the fewer, uh, the narrower versions of courage. You know, we always think about physical courage, whether that's um, going into the fray of battle or surviving an illness or the just the physical resilience of our lives. <clears throat> and we also think about moral courage, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, standing up for what's right. Um, but there's there's more kinds of courage. And I think if we expand our understanding of courage, we can think about how we can access our courage more often. Um, social courage is a, a courage that was named by Rollo May in his 1974 book, um, The Courage to Create. And that's the idea of um, being vulnerable and connecting with people, um, you know, being willing to wear your heart on your sleeve. And um, researcher Brittany Brown is making that concept more for, more um, talked about. Um, another type of courage that I love the idea about is creative courage. And it might be the least recognized type of all, but the one that we most need to cultivate. <clears throat> it's the courage to come up with creative solutions, um, creating community, creating meaning from challenge, um, creating new symbols and visions that people can rally around. And I think creating change that can move us forward. Um, the, there's another type of courage that seems to arise out of that, and we'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. Um, you know, the root words of courage come from the Latin or French core for heart, and also going back even further, the word fortitudo or fortitude. And so I think about courage as a strength of heart, um, and how do we fortify ourselves for, um, to develop our courage? Um, Parker, I'm really curious if you would talk a little bit about what the word creative means to you, because I think it's more than um, artistic talent. Well, thanks, Shelley and Becky. I'm just delighted to be here with all of you and with the folks who are tuning in. And I just want to say quickly that I'm very proud of this book. I'm very proud of its author, and I'm very proud of the work of the Center for Courage and Renewal. So. Um, let that be known. Um, I, I love your your typology of creativity because I think it comes in so many forms, or, or of courage uh, that comes in so many forms, and one of them certainly is creative courage. And I think we find creativity in in every walk of life. We sometimes limit these words way too much, so that we think of the creative painter or the creative musician or performing artist, but you know, parents are creative when they're raising children well. And um, plumbers are creative when they can figure out a solution to a problem that has vexed everyone else. Um, uh, leaders need to be creative. And when I think of leaders, I think of sort of a range of possibilities. Um, on the one hand, I think for leaders who are often getting into fixes of one sort or another, Creativity has to do with learning how to make lemonade when the situation hands you lemons. And, and that's often real courage is involved. I think, for example, of an organization where there's been a big mess up of some sort. It happens, train wrecks of various sorts. And it takes courage to do the one thing that I think is most necessary to move beyond the train wreck, and that's to tell the truth about what happened. Um, in our culture, we don't tell the truth much because we, we want to cover up and we, and we want to, in, in professional life, we want to cover, you know, cover each other up and not break the code. 
but it's been a very creative thing, for example, in, in hospitals, when leaders had the courage to say, look, we make medical mistakes a lot. That's what makes hospitalization the seventh or eighth leading cause of death, ironically, tragically. Um, so we need to create a penalty-free zone for, for reporting medical errors. Not, not the errors that come because the surgeon was drunk, but the errors that come because we're human. And if we can establish a penalty-free zone for being human and admitting our mistakes, we can then introduce systemic corrections that will keep that particular error, medical error, from happening more often. So there's that kind of courage. It takes guts for a leader to stand up and say, I no longer am willing to reward hiding secrets out and having each other's back. Instead, I'm, I'm, I want to reward honesty. It, it sounds like a no-brainer, but I think everybody knows in our culture it isn't. And then all the way to the other end where the leader can give up ego enough to say the only way to get creative here is to bring people together, to think it through together. Because under the right circumstances, which don't always obtain, but under the right circumstances, all of us together are smarter than any one of us thinking alone. But, you know, there are leaders who love the role because it puts the spotlight on them all the time. And they want the, the cred, street cred for having the answer always. I think a courageous leader says, I don't always have the answer. I need all of you to pitch in on this and we'll figure it out together. So that's what I think creative courage or the courage to be creative uh, means to me. Well, that leads really well into the next question that we outlined. How does that creative courage inspire collective courage? And you've started to talk to that, Paul Marcelli. Well, I love it, Parker, when you talk about the, um, the idea that we're all in this together and people coming together to collaborate. Um, you know, creative courage might start with an individual who's taking a stand to live with integrity, but then they inspire more participation through or a sense of voice and agency by many others. We've seen this with the Black Lives Matter and more recently the Me Too movement. Um, I was first really inspired by this concept or the phrase um, creative or collective courage by an activist named Bree Newsom. Um, back in 2015, right after the Charleston massacre, she climbed the flagpole and took down the Confederate flag. And I saw a statement that she made in the Blue Nation Review. And she said, as you are admiring my courage in that moment, Please remember that this is never, not and never has been and never should be about just one woman. This action required collective courage, just as this movement requires collective courage. And so I think that that's, it, we're calling, she's calling us, we're all calling each other into a multi-leader movement that we need to have all hands on deck. We need to have um, people who are engaged and feeling like they're living their purpose in a collective way that's making a bigger difference for a lot of people for the greater good. Parker, I think about um, your movement model um, that some people know about, but what would you say are the conditions required to generate and sustain co um, collective courage for the long haul? Yeah, well, without going into all the details of the movement model, which will, would take us longer than the hour we have to talk and then to receive comments and questions, I'll just say that I've done a 25, 30 year study of great social movements, the international women's movement, the black liberation movement, movements for freedom in Eastern Europe and in South Africa and in Latin America. Um, and in, in every one of those, something like the story you just told has actually happened. Somebody representing lots of other somebodies has, has kind of broken out with their personal truth, either the woman who needs to climb the flagpole and haul down the Confederate flag, or the woman who famously kept her seat on the bus uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, when she was told that she would go to jail if she stayed there. And in that case, the community rallied around her and all of her previous training in nonviolence, I'm talking about Rosa Parks, of course, kicked in 
Uh, but it doesn't always work that way. We, we know that seven or eight African-American women had done exactly what Rosa Parks had done before she did it. And they simply got ticketed or spent a few hours in jail and nothing, the community didn't, wasn't there. And that act of individual courage uh, didn't, didn't happen. But I think I'm really glad, Shelley, that you lifted up early here this notion that by leadership, we don't just mean the person who bears the title of leader. It's absolutely critical that we think about non-positional leaders. In fact, in today's America, by my best lights, we absolutely need non-positional leadership to get us out of the increasingly deeper hole that we're getting into. Um, we need citizen activists, citizen leaders. Just as in schools, there has been a call for some years now for teacher leaders who will organize around what's best for kids um, rather than around the, the, the standards or mandates handed down from decision-making tables where, where one thing is always true. There's no teacher at the table. And, and so the decisions are being made by the people who know the least about education rather than folks who know the most. One of the things we know a lot about based again on research, and I'm thinking now of the research of Tony Breik and Barbara Schneider, for example, uh, around courage in schools, or sorry, trust in schools. We know that something called relational trust is the key ingredient of mission success in any organization. You can throw a million dollars at an organization and ask it to achieve goal X in the next 12 months. And if there isn't relational trust there, and if there isn't a leader who's building relational trust day in and day out, you know exactly what's going to happen to that $1 million by the end of the year. No new goals will have been achieved, but people in the building will have spent the year fighting over who gets the most of that million dollars, who gets the biggest slice of the pie. So relational trust, you know, in a way, takes us right back to the earlier conversation about uh, courage and, and creativity. Um, it, it, we're, we're smarter together than we are alone. And we, in order to work effectively together, we need that kind of trust that transcends ego, that transcends greed, that transcends self-interest, and all of which is ruining or has ruined uh, too many of our institutions. This institutional logic of self-promotion, self-preservation, and self-protection. And so we need people to break through that with relational trust and, and put their heads out the window and say, we're not going to take this anymore. <laughs> That's really helpful. I want to uh, pick up a question on collective courage that came into the panel while while we're still on the topic of collective courage, if, if you don't mind. Um, Jane is wondering how we can develop collective courage to listen to others whose ideas, values, et cetera, may differ from ours. Great question. Jill, you want to take that? Well, that's a big question. Um, crossing lines of difference and um, keeping an open mind, we have some pr um, practices called touchstones that do exactly that, that help us um, listen to each other in a non-judgmental way. Um, there's three specific touchstones that come to mind, even though there's a, a larger circle of those. Um, the first one is the idea of um, turning to wonder when the going gets tough, turn to wonder. And so if you're listening to somebody and you think, wow, what's going on with that person? I wonder what it is in this story that's tr um, triggering something for them, or I wonder what this is telling me about myself. Um, that gives a moment of pausing and just a moment of grace so that you can continue to listen without judging what the other person is saying. Um, you can um, think, it too, about um, I'm not here to fix or save or advise that person. I'm here to just listen and get to know this person's story. Um, the third practice would be to follow up with an open, honest question and to ask, well, um, tell, 
tell me more about that, you know, without wondering, you know, not asking a leading question, trying to get them to answer something that you want to say, them to say or um, a yes or no kind of question, but truly an open, honest question that will just generate more conversation. Um, those three are a, a really good start so that we can start hearing what's behind our actions or what's behind, what are the values that we are bringing to the table, um, what are some things from our past that are giving us passion or heartbreak for a certain situation. Um, I think just having um, generative conversations like that are, is a really good start. Well, and I loved, I was reading some of the book last night, um, anticipating today, and I loved really understanding the interplay uh, between open-ended questions and then not rushing into fix. <laughs> um, right. And I found that to be a really insightful part of the yeah. book. We, we have, uh, all of that is, is very important to me as, as well. Just to throw in one more kind of answer, um, if I think about my own life experience and think about the possibility that I could have spent the last 79 years talking with no one other than members of my own tribe, uh, what's very clear to me is that I would know minus 10 about life, about myself, about the world, because when you keep recycling the same ideas that are formed by people who are formed by the same culture that formed you, you, you simply don't get a broader view of the world. And when you don't get a broader view of the world, you, you don't have those places to stand where you can get a truer picture of yourself. It's just interesting to me how knowledge of the world and knowledge of yourself interrelate. So I think I have a tremendous amount of self-interest invested in not having shootouts with people who differ from me, but, but rather, as Shelley was suggesting, inquiring into them, either silently or actively. And I think one of the best ways to inquire into them or us I, there's a poet who has a wonderful line. I wish I could remember her name. She says, are we not of interest to each other? And, and we are, of course. We're of great interest to each other once we, once we take off the, the armor of fear that keeps us from going there. But one of the best ways I know is to ask the person to tell me a story about his or her life that will help me understand why he or she believes what they believe. We do a lot of that in circles of trust too. We, we invite autobiographical stories. And as has often been said, the more you know about another person's story, the less possible it is to dislike, distrust, or dismiss them. And in my mind, in our world, every step you can take toward not disliking, distrusting, or dismissing another person is an absolutely critical step for the well being of the whole and for your own well-being. You know, uh, I, at age 79, I think about my own mortality a bit more than I did when I was 29. And I, I can't think of a, of a sadder way to die than with the feeling that I was never at home in this world with its rich and complex diversity, or that I was never at home in my own skin because I was always defending what's in here against what's out there. That's sad. And unfortunately, there are people who, who go that route. But I think part of the work we do is to help people see that the advantage lies in going the other direction for everyone. Well, and that leads us really well into our next question. Um, in the book, you talk about the Mobius Strip and use it to demonstrate how uh, a life can be lived with integrity. Can we talk a little bit about that, Shelley? Um, the Mobius Strip is one of my favorite metaphors that Parker brought in, um, in through his writing, and it's the idea of integrating your inner life with your outer life. Um, there's a, um, well, Parker, I think it would just be best to have you just jump right into a demonstration because it's just better seen than talked about. Okay, so this is this is my Mobius Strip, or at least this is the. Uh, the Quaker PowerPoint that with which one can demonstrate the Mobius strip, um, and and it, it's interesting. I'm 
I, I learned from Delta Airlines the other day that I've achieved a million miles. So this Mobius trip has traveled a million miles with me <laughs> over the last like hundred years. So if you imagine that the purple is the inside backstage component of your life, the inner life where, you know, we have all these kind of three in the morning thoughts about what we value, what we believe, what troubles us, what questions we're holding, what scares us, what gives us joy. And then the other side of the strip is the white side is, is your external life, the, the, the side of you that faces the world where values and beliefs and so forth get confusing. But what most of us care too much about is, uh, is things like impact. Am I making a difference? influence you know am, am i nudging things along and and image and do i look good while i'm doing it you know do they like me and all all of that very human questions but if you form a mobius strip which is formed by bringing this thing into a circle and then giving one end half a twist and and rejoining it there in this interesting shape that was actually discovered by mathematicians. What's interesting about this shape is that it's a, a three-dimensional object that has only one side. And um, you, can, you can prove it to yourself by taking your finger and tracing it along what seems to be the inside of the Mobius strip. And suddenly and seamlessly, you find yourself on what seems to be the outside of the Mobius strip and then back in again. So. The, the message of the Mobius strip is, and I, and I love this when I first realized it, there ain't no inner and outer because the inner and the outer keep co-creating each other in, in not only in this little piece of paper, but in our lives. So to put it very briefly, I have a lot of stuff going on inside of me. Don't we all, you know, I have my joys, I have my fears, I have my loves, I have my hates and so forth and so on. And I have choices to make about what I bring forth from within me and put into the outer world. And those choices make a difference because if I put my hate out there instead of my love, I start co-creating a hateful world that damages me and those around me. And then whatever I put out there, let's take love for example, the world tosses stuff back at me. And I, and I have to internalize it in some way. And if I put love out there, what sometimes happens, maybe often happens, is that the world throws back hate or throws back, you're naive. How could you possibly believe that? Or loving that person is treasonous, you know, or, or wrong or empty headed. And I have choices to make about how I process that internally. So on the Mobius strip and in life generally, we're not only co-creating a world, we're co-creating ourselves. And, and I think at, at some of the deepest levels, this is the kind of trip that people learn to take in our circles of trust, a life-giving trip on the Mobius strip, which brings new life to the world and to themselves, rather than a death-dealing trip where we are putting out there and then processing what comes back, things in a way that creates something less than life and sometimes things that are actually deadly. So it, to me, it's a powerful reminder of, of how integrity means oneness. It, it means wholeness. And, and the Mobius strip is an example of wholeness with one really important proviso which we emphasize a lot in our work. Wholeness does not mean perfection. If, if, you, if that's your standard, you will fail. I know this because I fail at the perfection test constantly. Um, wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing your imperfections as an integral part of your life. In, integrity, integral, being one, if you can embrace it all, if you can say, I am all of the above, if, if I can say, I am not only this guy who's sitting here right now being reasonably coherent around questions that I hold of, of importance, but 
But I'm also the guy who took three deep dives into clinical depression, which I wrote about in several books and talk about a fair amount because it's therapeutic for me and it's helpful to the millions of sufferers to hear that there can be life on the other side of that deep darkness. That's wholeness to me. It's, it's not about either being perfect or, God forbid, pretending that I'm perfect. You know, I've, I've said about my new book, this new book is not about growing old gracefully because I don't know zip about that. I, I, my life has been grace, but not graceful. I've done a lot of falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up. Well, I think the work of the Center for Courage and Renewal, what Shelley writes about in this wonderful book, is, is a path toward understanding wholeness in that way. Because in that circle, we hear stories of brokenness and of struggle. And we start realizing we're all in this together. And in some way, we all have the same story. Wow, that's really helpful and encouraging too. Um, and I know I'm, I'm not taking notes, but I, I want to. We should be tweeting this, wholeness is not perfection. So that Mobius strip metaphor is, is so powerful and provides a new way for all of us to think about uh, life and leadership. And I understand, Parker, even just from a quick visit to your Facebook page today, that poetry is another way that we can think beyond the box. So let's speak for a few minutes about ways leaders can use the arts like poetry to increase their effectiveness. Well, it, as I was interviewing leaders for the book, I um, came across a lot of CEOs who were fans of poetry and had started using it in their their work. And it's such a surprise for people who are in a meeting to have the boss show up and start a meeting with a, with a poem. Um, one physician leader that I met, um, he said that when he greets new employees into the organization, and it might be a room of 200 new employees starting at a time, that he'll start with a poem just to set the tone that this is something different, that he's expecting a different kind of creativity. Um, another CEO that I talked to has a poetry app, and he uses it to inspire um, himself every day. He just kind of keeps, keeps an eye on it. Um, there's um, other stories that, um, you know, when you're, in a, when you're stuck in a meeting, um, if you can, if you start a meeting with poetry, just to have a conversation, a moment of reflection, it's a chance to tell somebody a little bit about what's important to you. It generates different parts of the brain to, to be engaged. And then it's something that you can even point back to, and it kind of gives you a common language that you can refer back to. One doctor was talking about a, a Rilke poem that was used in a um, meeting, and there's a, a line in it that says, no feeling is final. And a couple hours later, at the end of a rough meeting, one of his um, team members said, hey, don't forget, no feeling is final. And so he was happy that that moment of poetry could come back and encourage him at a moment um, that was a, a little on the rough, rough side. Um, Parker, I know that poetry is um, an important part for you. Um, in your reflective life. Um, what are some ways that conversations become more generative when we bring something in like a poem? Well, you know, I, I, we, uh, I think we experience that, as you know, Shelley, all the time in circles of trust. And I, and I think the reason is that when you put a good poem in the center of, a, of, of the circle, as it were, and everybody actually has it in their hands, and we explore that poem, the question is not, what did the poet mean by this? That's a kind of academic question. Our question is, what does this poem mean to you? What does this poem evoke in you? Where does it intersect your life? And what does it allow you to hold that would be hard to hold otherwise? Um, you know, when you mentioned the medical context and people in medicine, physicians, for example, everyone involved hold some very hard questions like, a patient dies and it happens regularly. How do you hold that as you go through the day? And we've had physicians who lead resident programs or who lead grand rounds say, you know, I started using a poem or two that were, was used in, in my circle of trust that sort of holds the question of death and in a, in a, in a metaphorical way. Um, and that has allowed me to hold that with other 
folks who were involved in the death of that patient. We read that poem. We, we, we talk about this death not in clinical terms, but in terms of personal meaning, facilitated by a poem that isn't a, a textbook on how to do anesthesia or how to do thoracic surgery, but that, that is a textbook about human life, about human emotions, um, that, that allows us to hold very hard questions in something other than an academic way. I, I like to quote Emily Dickinson, as you know, Shelley, who, who famously said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. And, and that's so different from the academic training I got where you never do anything on the slant. Every question you, you, you're put, is, that's put in front of you, you run at with full speed with all your analytic tools in hand. And there are a whole lot of life questions that, that, where that just results in slamming into a wall and you know, then having to pick yourself up because you didn't, you didn't, get, you didn't look, go to it on the slant in a way that might allow you to get through it or under it or around it in a creative and generative and life-giving way. So when we hold things in, in metaphors, you know, go to a great piece of theater and have the experience of, my gosh, this, this playwright lived a hundred years before I was born and yet he or she is writing about my life. How does that happen? You know, well, that's what art does. Art creates containers for holding our lives and looking at them in new ways. And for us, as you know, Shelley, in circles of trust, as you know very well, you've written about it, you've been there, you've done it. Um, in circles of trust, we use a lot of the arts and metaphorical material to do exactly that. Well, I have a question that's in the moment, so I want to address it while we're talking about poetry. Nick is wondering if you have any suggested sources or poets to begin exploring this, if you're a leader who wants to incorporate poetry. Well, I know that I, I like to subscribe to the poets.org website because that gives me a poem a day in my inbox. You can sign up for that and be introduced to... Um, poets from all walks of life and all different centuries and decades. Um, you know, I, I think it takes time to um, find somebody that you resonate with, but um, some of our favorite poets are uh, Rilke, um, William Stafford, um, Maya Angelou, um, Mary Oliver. Um, it just kind of goes on and on. Uh, there's a poet from Wales named William Ayotte, who is one of my favorite poets. He wrote um, a book called Email from the Soul. And it's um, poetry that speaks to the business leader. Um, it's, it's very relevant and new and fresh today. So um, some of his poems are in the book. When we were talking earlier about Parker's Facebook page, I happened to notice that he regularly shares poems there. So you could uh, take a look at Parker's uh, fan page on Facebook as a place for poems. Parker? Yeah. Thank you, Becky. Yeah, I do. I do a couple times a week. I'll post a poem and a little commentary on it. And I usually do it up with an image. Uh, it's, it's my art form, you know, for, for a guy who can't who was told he was bad at coloring in grade school. This, this is my art form. I'll just, uh, that was a great list that Shelley offered and great suggestions. I'll just share with people my favorite uh, collection of poetry in terms of its title. Um, th this is a collection of poetry by Tony Hoagland, uh, who's a wonderful poet, with the, <laughs> with the title I really envy. The title of his collection is what narcissism means to me. <laughs> I wish I'd written a book with that title. That's a great title. And we do have a request uh, from Elise that we um, compile the list that you just shared, Shelley, and put it in our follow-up email so we can be sure to make that edit so that people who are listening will be able to access those resources. Great. And on our Courage and Renewal website, we have uh, quite a few poetry resources, too, and how to use poetry, and we can um, add that link to it as well. We've okay. done some poetry anthologies that are um, poets that leaders love and their reflection on how, how they use those poems. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Shelley. Fire, and I've lost the title of the other one. Leading from Within and Teaching with Heart and Teaching with Fire. Yeah, so a bunch of them. 
So Parker, you were referencing how poetry is really important because it gives us containers through which we can process those difficult questions in our lives. And part of that is taking care of ourselves as leaders. So I was wondering if we could spend a few minutes talking about how leaders can embrace the need for self-care and model self-care to their followers. Well, I'm going to say that self-care is probably one of the, well, I know for sure that this chapter was the hardest to write because I felt like I was not living it, um, that it's really hard to put down the things that you're passionate about and give yourself a weekend off <laughs> or give yourself time to breathe. Um, you know, I came across a, po um, a quote from Parker, though, way back in 2003 when I was doing a writing program that happened to be a Circle of Trust style writing program. And I was doing a memoir on being a cancer caregiver and cancer caregivers and, um, you know, of all kinds know very much what compassion fatigue feels like and how hard it is to stop and take care of yourself. But this quote from Parker has always meant a lot to me. And so this is in the middle of, um, this is begins chapter six of the courage way is self care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have the gift I was put on earth to offer to others. Anytime we can listen to true self and give it the care it requires, we do so not only for ourselves, but for the many others whose lives we touch. Parker, that was from Let Your Life Speak, and that became a mantra for me for years, and I still just shorthand it. You know, self-care is never a selfish act, and sometimes um, at work we say, you know, I need to invoke the self-care clause because I need a day off in the middle of a busy project or... Right. Um, and I think it's important for people to think beyond the idea of self-care as purely physical, just like courage is not just physical courage or moral courage. Um, but we're talking about care of true self. And we haven't talked a lot about um, the idea of true self today. Um, we go into that more in the book. But um, Parker, would you talk a little bit about the difference um, for you between care of self-care self and care of true self? And what's one way that leaders can care for their true self? Yeah, well, thank you, Shelley. I'm touched, you know, that that quote uh, meant a lot to you. I, of course, I've known that, but it's just lovely to hear it again in this context. Um, because it came from a very important place in my life. And I'll loop back now to where, where I sort of started making lemonade when life hands you lemons. Um, for me, that really came out of my experience of clinical depression, which had, which had come about in part. I mean, I think depression is a very complex thing. Nobody, anybody who says they fully understand it is not telling you the truth. And you can stop listening to them at that point. It, it has genetic components. It has brain chemistry components. It has situational components. There's a lot we don't know about it, and it's hard to tell what the mix of causal factors is. But in my case, I'm pretty clear that my depressions had to do, um, you know, with, with situations that I had gotten myself into, with situational uh, elements of my life. And, um, the, the, and it's a devastating experience to go there once, twice, three times into this, what essentially is an annihilation of self. It took me 10 years before I could write about it or speak about it because I don't think you should do that until it's something like that is fully integrated into your own sense of who you are. But that very journey is a journey to true self. Um, it's a journey to peeling back the layers of your masks, your false images, the face you've presented to the world that isn't anywhere near the whole of who you are. Um, and incidentally, I'm not saying don't hold any secrets. I mean, Jung said the soul needs its secrets. You know, we need, there are some things that if you put them out there, they get distorted and, and they get stylized in some way that falsifies the experience for you. But once I realized, oh, I'm okay with saying to people, I am all of the above, you know, I am my light and I am my shadow. I am whatever I've done well and I am all the holes I've fallen into. 
that became an act of self-care for me and an, and an act, I, I call it a therapeutic act, but it, it also turns out that of all the things I've written, a chapter in Let Your Life Speak, a little tiny book about my experience with depression is probably the one thing I hear the most about. Uh, you know, I hear professionally about other, other books, but that chapter evokes a really heartfelt response from a lot of people. So it, it's self-care, I think, loops right back to a certain kind of truth-telling um, about who we are and how we are. We have this wonderful William Stafford poem called A Ritual to Read to Each Other, which is all about not trying to fool each other about who we are, because when we do, we get led in the wrong direction. We, as William Stafford says, we follow the wrong star home. And of course, then you never get home. So I, I think self-care is a lot about, about self-truth and sharing it in ways that are appropriate to the situation and that, are, that make you feel whole and help other people feel whole. As I've often said, the best words that have ever been spoken to me when I've been in a broken condition are welcome to the human race. You know, that's the way, that's what, it, that's part of what it is to be human. And those are the words I hope to speak. And I think in our work, we speak to other people, welcome to the human race. And I'll just conclude by quoting that line that always comes to me when I talk about this stuff from Leonard Cohen, you know, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Those are powerful lines when you stop and think how that might apply to my own life. If I stop, if I just ring the bells that still can ring and forget my perfect offering and, and then start to realize, yeah, there is a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. That's back to relational trust. We don't connect with each other around reciting our list of successes. We do connect with each other around what we struggle with, what feels like our defeat, what we're trying to rise up from, that's where the human connection occurs. And if we play games that none of that is going on, there is no relational trust. And relationships fall apart, organizations fall apart when we're playing games of that silly sort. You know, we all, we look, I mean, you know, the call to every one of us is, is be a grown up. <laughs> and go there. Wow, that's really powerful and helpful. Um, we're gonna shift now to taking some questions from attendees and we've had very many of them put in throughout the, the event. Some we touched on in the moment and some we left for later. Um, and so I'll do my best to bring as many of the questions as, as I can in the time that we have remaining. And we would also welcome you to come back to our second conversation in just a few hours from now. Um, and, and perhaps there's a way um, through the blog at the Center for Courage and Renewal that some of these questions could also be answered. Um, so here's one. Uh, Doug is wondering, what is your experience of the dance between vulnerability and courage in a culture that reveres strength and the knowing mind? Mm -hmm. I'll just take a quick shot at that one. Um, I'm really, really clear that the strongest people are the people who can be vulnerable. Um, th that requires strength. And I think if you, if, if you do that, if you become vulnerable with awareness, with full awareness of your responsibilities in the situation, then people do perceive strength in you and you not only can continue to lead, your leadership can be deepened. I'll give you just a quick example, which has to do with the way we prepare or train the facilitators for our organization, 300 plus of them around the world right now. We, we always say to them, you need to be part of this process yourself. You need to be not only the facilitator of the process, but a participant in it. Because if you're asking people to be vulnerable, but you're not willing to be vulnerable yourself, why should they trust you? How do you create a circle of trust when the leader isn't trusting enough to be vulnerable? But at the same time, you we're holding a paradox, which is another big concept in our work, right, Shelley? And you write about in your book, of course. 
And, and the paradox is that, that there are ways to become vulnerable that make people worry about you. <laughs> like, is this guy going to fall apart? Or will he be, be, still be able to facilitate this process? That's why I had to wait 10 years before I could write or speak about my experience of depression. But once it was fully integrated into me, I didn't scare people with it. They, 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 they could see that I was speaking from an integral place, which isn't, you know, mus this muscle power or this, you know, this overwhelming power. That, that's about authority. And I love the word authority as distinct from power because authority is when people perceive you as authoring your own actions, your own words, being who you really are, and they grant you authority. That's not, not something I can ask for. People grant it if, if they perceive me as fully human. That's really helpful. So I'm seeing some questions regarding relational trust and the two of you have referenced that a few times uh, during the conversation. Can you give us some tips on the best ways to develop relational trust, perhaps in organizations where it might be missing? Hmm. Well, the way that we talk about relational trust in the book is about um, four different lenses. And it's, what, what was interesting to me is that it's not so much about how another person is acting, but about your own perceptions and your own assumptions and biases that you're projecting on that other person. Um, but if you think about these four lenses, then you can start to look and see is, if this is a piece that's missing. Um, the four lenses are um, personal regard, professional respect, competence, and integrity. And to start thinking about, well, um, do I feel like the other person likes me and cares about me as a person? That's part of personal regard. Um, have they done some, have they shown that they're, um, they're paying attention to my life and not just the work life? Um, professional respect is that sense that we all um, believe that our roles are important par a contribution to the whole and that we listen to each other's opinions and take them seriously and put them into the mix when decisions are being made. Competence is one where we're just constantly assessing whether people have, have um, what it takes to get the job done, but it's not in terms of the performance evaluation. It's really like, do we know the whole story or is there training that needs to happen so that somebody can um, perform their job well? Um, if you're feeling being like yourself being judgmental around somebody's lack of competence, is there a role that you can play to help them learn what they need to learn? And uh, integrity is, um, you know, when we sense a consistency between people, what they, what they say and what they do, are they walking their talk? Um, but Reich and Schneider go into it a little bit um, further and they say, it's also how leaders and followers make sense of their work together. And are we, why are we really here? Do we have a shared purpose? Do we agree to that shared purpose? And do I see that the actions you're taking as a leader are actually for the good of the people that we serve um, most downstream? So are we doing something in schools for the sake of the children or in healthcare? Are we making decisions truly for what's best for the patient? Um, it's really just looking for people who are going that extra mile. So integrity can take a lot to unpack, but it's interesting to think if, if, those, if one of those four pieces are missing, what can you do to take responsibility for um, reflecting on that and seeing, seeing what might need to change or what you can do to change and reach out to other people? I think that's a, the, the, that's a powerful response to the question, I think. Um, I just would add one thing to it that, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that when, when most people think about relational trust, they think simply about, well, simply is the wrong word, they think only about what goes on between me and V, you know, in, in, a, in a working relationship. But none of that is going to happen if I'm not doing my own inner work. Um, so to enter into relational trust, I need to get my ego out of the way. I, I need to... I need to stop thinking it's all about me. Um, I need to get my my greed and my jealousy out of the way. I, I, I need to stop 
thinking, you know, zero sum, like if you win, then I lose. So am I going to help you win? No, I'm not. And, you know, one of the terrifying things that goes on in our institutions, education is a great example, is that systems actually get set up, which force people into that zero sum game. So, you know, when, when standardized testing is used to reward some people for getting students to a point where they score well and punish other people, because even though they have maybe a more difficult group of students to work with, they lose points when their students don't perform well. Is the teacher who, perf who performs well going to go down the hall and say, let me help you out? No, because the, the bonus goes to the people who get the higher test scores and the demerits go to the people who go get the lower test scores. So one of, you know, one of the things Brick and Schneider say, and as Shelley knows in their research on relational trust in schools, is we ought never to pass a piece of educational legislation without asking the question, what impact is this going to have on relational trust? Now, I frankly think that's asking too much of our Congress at the moment. Um, they're just having a hard time with things like their zip codes and stuff like that, let alone subtleties and nuances of this sort. Um, I, I, but I do think that within institutions, leaders who have some kind of policy control, as it were, over what goes on, can be asking that question. This decision that I'm about to make, this action I'm about to take, this speech I'm about to give, what's its impact going to be on relational trust? It's a good litmus test for all kinds of things. Thanks, that's very helpful. Um, so as we wrap up the hour, there was a question in the uh, question panel, actually a comment about the touchstone turn to wonder. And I thought particularly since we had talked about the role that poetry can play, I would like to read this comment if it's, it's okay. It came from Andrew. Um, turn to wonder. When the going gets tough, turn to wonder. A crack that catches the light by a sideways glance, invading the darkness of questions that only make sense from the other side. Wonder, like the burning bush, frees you from all names spoken over your life. Wonder, like sky, once held every drop that became an ocean, a well to quench the deepest of thirst. Wonder, wait, turning gravity into gravitas of heart, mind, and soul. Andrew, not sure where that came from, but it was beautiful. I wanted everyone to enjoy it together. I, I think we have a poet in our midst. That's beautiful. Thank you. So Thank you, Andrew. So I want to take a few minutes to let you know some next steps that you could take if you enjoyed today's content. So the first thing that you could do is you could go over to Amazon and you could buy your copy of The Courage Way. Um, the second thing you could do is visit the CourageRenewal.org website and you can sign up to hear more through the newsletters that come from the center. And Shelley also referenced at that website, you'll find um, some poetry resources. You can follow both the, Cur the Center for Courage and Renewal and Parker J. Palmer on Facebook. And you can explore the center's online resources, retreats, and programs. We want to thank you so much for your interest and attention and participation in this webinar event. And another next step could be to join us again in just six hours when we have a completely different set of questions that we're going to discuss that highlight um, the content from The Courage Way. Shelly and Parker, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, thanks, Becky. Becky. Thanks, Parker. Thanks, Thanks everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone.